cuckold is an old word. It's a word that it's been reduced and become kind of a foul word on the internet. But it's an old word. It's kind of an interesting word. It's the husband of an adulteress, often regarded as an object of derision. You don't want to be called this. If you are called it, it is usually an insult. And it's actually a rather interesting word because the word actually comes from the old French, from the cuckoo. And so in I first came across these words and I thought, I don't know what these words mean, so you do a little bit of research. And then I learned a little bit about the cuckoo bird. Apparently what the cuckoo bird does, it's a very crafty bird, the bird lays its, lay, its eggs in the nests of other birds. So the other birds will do all the hard work of keeping, of keeping the cuckoo's egg warm and in terms, of, in terms of natural process, the cuckoo gets away with things. So, but to, um, to be a couple is not a good thing. Now, pair bonding possessiveness is something we don't think about a lot about, but it's almost always true. We hear about jealous lovers, the jealous husband, or the jealous wife, the, the woman spurned, the, the, the fierce anger of someone who is betrayed. And actually, if you look in the animal kingdom, there are a lot of examples of this, even as, even though many animals do not pair bond, um, there's a lot of competition. When Jane Goodall went and did studies of chimpanzees in Africa, everyone looked at those chimps and thought, oh, they're so cute. But the chimps are actually tremendously fierce and competitive animals. Female chimps, if they get the chance, will kill the young of rival females, which is incredibly brutal. And, and we see this often in, in the world. You have the, you have the stories about, in fairy tales, about the evil stepmother. And if you, look at, if you look at social science today, they will tell you that step-parents often don't treat their stepchildren very well. Some do, and I don't want to um, disregard those, but it is very, very common to treat your biological children far better than children who are not your biological children. And so we see this both in terms of romantic relationships, but also in terms of children, which is where this, this word gets its connotation. Because the connotation is somebody else, basically somebody else is taking advantage of you and getting the goods that you believe are due you. Now the story of the Bible begins with God making the world good. And the man and the woman decide it isn't quite good enough and that they can improve it by taking it their way. Now at this point God has to make a decision. And a lot of the Bible stories are, are often kind of they kind of echo a lot of other Bible stories. And so when we find, for example, Nebuchadnezzar, this great king of Babylon, who made this beautiful hanging garden. Actually, it's kind of an artificial mountain for one of his wives who was homesick. If the gardeners of the hanging gardens of Babylon basically said to Nebuchadnezzar, yeah, king, you got your ideas for the garden, but I'm going to take it my own way. It'd be like hiring a painter to come into your house and you say to the painter, I'd like to paint this room yellow. And you get home at the end of the day and he's painted it red. And you say, I thought I said to paint the, the room yellow. And he said, no, I don't care what you think. Um, most painters like that wouldn't have a job the next day. So when the man and the woman decide they want to take, Adam and Eve decide they want to take creation in a different way, God has some decisions to make. And so what basically God does is exile them from the garden. The ground is cursed, and she will have pain and childbearing, but he doesn't kill them. He doesn't annihilate them. He doesn't lobotomize them so that they become robots. And in fact, God gives them a chance to say, okay, you want to take this world in your way? Let's see how it goes. And actually, the story says it doesn't go well. Their first two sons, one kills the other. And then a few generations later, we have Lamech killing someone 
for insulting him and bragging to his wives about it. And in fact, in those early chapters of Genesis, you have technology increasing, but we use that technology often against each other. It's basically, we began the story by saying, nobody can tell me what to do, and then what we do with it is this gets passed on to our children, and we find ever more barbaric ways of trying to enforce, you want to have a seat, Greg? Hey, Greg. Yeah. You want to have a seat? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but everybody's watching you instead of watching me. So what we do is we find ever more barbaric ways to try to control one another and get what we want from each other. Now, what God does in this process is in the early stories of Genesis, there are some new starts. And so what we see before the flood, God looks around and people are so bad to each other. God laments us. God laments making us, and so then he decides, well, I'm going to take the very best man in the world, and I'm going to save his family and get rid of all the other people. That's kind of a version of, well, let's save the good people and get rid of the bad people. But what we discover in that story is that you can't just separate the good people from the bad people. That the line, as Solzhenitsyn said, between good and evil runs through every human heart. So then we imagine if God had a suggestion box, another thing he'd pull out of it would be, well, let's give carrots and sticks. Let's tell people these are the right things to do, these are the wrong things to do, and if you, if you do the right things, I'll reward you, and if you do the wrong things, I'll punish you. And you think, and you say, well, that works pretty good with my dog, and it kind of works with people because I don't drive as fast as, I'm, as I would like, and I pay my taxes, and I try not to break the law in front of a police officer. And so in a sense with Abraham, he, he, he starts a new people, and he's going to try to get these people to trust him. And that launches us on this long story of Israel. The trouble is with Israel, it doesn't seem to work. Now, if you've ever, if you went to college you might, or high school, you might have read a little bit of Plato's Republic. And, and in Plato's Republic, Plato is trying to figure out what is justice and how, how, how is a person just or righteous and who is a just or righteous person. And he says, well, a person is kind of small to see, so let's blow it up. And most of Plato's Republic is he's trying to find out, describe what a just city would be. Well, we're going to look at the book of Hosea, and what Hosea does is exactly the opposite. Because the question is, did God's experiment through Israel turn out well? And the answer is no. And then the question is, why not? And God says, Hosea, I want you to illustrate what my relationship with Israel is like to me. Now, we've been looking at some of these Old Testament prophets, and, and often we get the idea that a prophet comes and says, this is what God has to say, blah, 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 blah. But here's the thing about people. As any parent will know, your children will probably grow up to do more of what you do than what you said they should do. And hence we get the old refrain, actions speak louder than words. So if you like to smoke and you smoke every day, you say, son, don't smoke, it's bad for you. Guess what? Kid's probably going to smoke. You can say, I told that kid not to smoke. Yeah, but you did it. And the kid watched. We learn more through our eyes often than we do through our ears. So God sends Hosea and says to Hosea, now Hosea, I've got a job for you. And this is it. The word of the Lord came to Hosea, son of Barry, during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and during the reign of Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel. Now we went through all these kings over the last number of months, you might remember, and I won't blame you for not exactly remembering the details of this, but basically these were pretty good times in the northern and southern kingdom. Things were going fairly well. 
In other words, the Assyrians weren't coming down to raid and steal and kill and take slaves. And so the nations were doing quite well. And a lot of people would imagine, people often have kind of a karma sense about the way things go. Just this morning, in fact, there was a guy in the parking lot. And when I get to church and there's someone in the parking lot, I usually go over and try and figure out what it is. And he said to me, boy, Jesus has been hard on me. And I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be interesting. Well, basically, he had run out of gas, and he was having a fight with his ex-wife, and, and his truck broke down and all this stuff. So I gave him a little bit of gas money, and he got to move his truck. But immediately it went to his thought, Jesus is punishing me for something. And I thought, well, that could be, or it could be that you just ran out of gas. Um, and that you didn't watch the gas cage, or you didn't have enough money, or something like that. But we tend to have this kind of view of karma. When things are going good, we think, well, God is pretty happy with me. Things are going good. And when things go bad, ooh, I must have done something wrong. Well, sometimes, but certainly not all the time. But at this point, Israel, is feel Israel and Judah are kind of feeling like things are good. And so God sends Hosea, and God says basically through Hosea, I want you to show Israel what my side of this relationship is like. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So he married Gomer, daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre at Jezreel, and it will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. In that day I will break Israel's vow in the valley of Jezreel. Now right away, Jezreel, that's kind, well, that's not too odd of a name. But the tag isn't very good. But God isn't done. Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call her Lo Ruhamah, which means not loved, for I will no longer show love to Israel that I should at all that I should at all forgive them. Yet I will show love to Judah, and I will save them, not by bow, sword, or battle, or by horses or horsemen. But I, the Lord, their God, will save them. Well, then why not give her a nice name instead of not loved? After she had weaned Lo Ruhama, Gomer had another son. Then the Lord said, Call him Lo Ami, which means not my people, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. What is going on here? God is divorcing his people. Now, there's a thing called an antinomy. An antinomy is a funny thing, because what an antinomy basically means is that you have two ideas that you cannot put together, but you have a sense that they're both true. And what we have in the book of Hosea is, in a sense, an antinomy, because on one hand, what can God do with us if we are such a bad match? Nothing. And so here God, in a sense, says, I'm done, I'm divorcing you, goodbye. The brutality and bloodshed that Jehu did in Jezreel, I can't abide. I don't love you anymore. You are not my people. Have you ever had a fight with your spouse? Have you ever said something categorical? I don't love you anymore. I never want to see you again. Did you mean it when you said it? Probably did, or you wouldn't have said it. Two days later, did you mean it then? Or did you come back and say, I said that. I want to take it back. What's God going to do?
Yet the Israelites will be like the sand on the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted. And the place where it was said, you are not my people, they will be called children of the living God. The people of Judah and the people of Israel will come together and they will appoint one leader and will come up out of the land. For great will be the day of Jezreel. He just flipped it. Say of your brothers, my people, remember the daughter was not loved and the son was not my people. And of your sisters, my loved ones. What's happening here through Hosea? The real question is, how can this be done? And then we're going to do another sermon next week on Hosea and Gomer, because here's the way we work. You have a fight. I hate you. I don't love you. I never want to see you again. Time goes past. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. I want to make up. Patch things up. How's it going to go after that? Hard to know. You've already been to the brink, haven't you? See, Israel is a very bad partner. She's making God look like a dupe. Because everybody in town knows this guy is feeding her, but she's running around with everybody else. And everybody in town is talking. And when those kids show up, with their funny names, what does everybody in town think has happened? And whose kids are those? And Hosea is putting a roof over her head and giving her clothes and giving her food, but the cow's giving its milk to every Tom, Dick, or Harry, and everybody knows it. So what does the town think of Hosea? Cuckold. They have other words for him. What will God do? Will he be like the sons of Adam and Eve who multiplied violence to subdue and enslave his unruly wife? That's an option. Men are usually stronger than women. Beat her. Did you ever watch The Color Purple? Had an unruly wife, right? What was the advice given to the man? Beat her. What will God do? Rebuke your mother. Rebuke her. For she is not my wife. We're back to the angry. And I, will, I am not her husband. Let her remove the adulterous look from her face and the unfaithfulness from between her breasts. Otherwise I will strip her naked and make her as bare as on the day she was born, and I will make her like a desert. Turn her into a parched land and slay her with thirst. God is saying, I give you all of this rain. What do you do? I will not show my love to her children because they are the children of adultery. Their mother has been unfaithful and has conceived them in disgrace. She said, I will go after my lovers who give me my food and my water and my wool and my linen, my olive oil and my drink. She says, I don't need you, Hosea. Lots of men will give me stuff. Lots of men will put me up. Lots of men will show me kindness. Therefore, I will block her path with thorn bushes, and I will wall her in so that she cannot find her way. What's interesting is that there's a lot of resonance between this and the prodigal son story, where the prodigal son says to the father, I want your stuff, but I don't want you. And the father, to the amazement of the village, says, you can have your inheritance early. And he takes the money and goes to a far off country and he squanders it and he loses all the money and he is reduced to feeding pigs. And when he's feeding pigs, he comes to his senses. But does his heart change? And he says, you know, my father's servants, they never lack food. They have better work than I have. My father's a softy. I'll go back to him, and I'll plead, and he'll take me back. Now, a lot of you disagree with my reading on the prodigal son, but my justification is this. Jesus is talking to the scribes and the Pharisees, and the son of the man goes back with Pharaoh's speech. He quotes Pharaoh, the prodigal son does, when he's feeding the pigs. 
and he quotes Pharaoh because, you know, when the plague of locusts came, Pharaoh was like, oh, this is horrible. i got to get rid of this. i got to solve this. So call Moses in, and he says, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. So then the locusts move on, but after the locusts have gone, guess what happens to Pharaoh? Back to plan A. Back to Hosea. Therefore I will take away my grain when it ripens and my new wine when it is ready. And I will take back my wool and my linens intended to cover her naked body. So now I will expose her lewdness before the eyes of her lovers. No one will take her out of my hands. So what is he saying? She wants to run around? Let her run around. Let her live with them and see how they like it. I will stop all her celebrations, her yearly festivals, her new moons, her Sabbath days, all her appointed festivals. I will ruin her vines and her fig trees, which she has, which, which she said were her pay from her lovers. Those are the other gods that Israel is talking about. I will make them a thicket, and wild animals will devour them. I will punish her for the day she burned incense to the bales. She decked herself with rings and jewelry, and went after her lovers. But me she forgot, declares the Lord. Therefore I am not going to allure her. I will lead her into the wilderness and speak tenderly. I am now going to allure her. I will lead her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. There I will give her back her vineyards, and I will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. There she will, she will respond as in the days of her youth, as in the days she came out of Israel. God sends her into hard times and then says, now are you willing to come back? In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband and you will no longer call me my master. I will remove the names of the Baals from her lips. No longer will their names be invoked. Now you might see in that day at this moment, and you might remember last week's sermon if you were here, and you might remember that I said something about Judgment Day and the Day of the Lord and how that works. And you find this in the Old Testament books again and again in the prophets where, well, you come to Judgment Day. Well, what is Judgment Day? It's when you've had the fight and you've opened up, I was going to say the phone book, we don't use those anymore. You went to Google and you typed in divorce lawyers and you looked at the page and you stopped and you said, do I want to go here? Do I want to do this? Am I ready to cross that threshold? And then you stop. That's judgment day. Judgment day is God showing up. Now you're sitting across and you're saying, what are we going to do? Are we going to do this? Are we going to make up? And what's it going to cost? See, the problem is we are like Gomer. Implicitly in our minds, we all imagine we have been the one that has been betrayed. But the way the story works, God has been betrayed. We, like the prodigal son and Adam and Eve, want God's stuff, but we don't want Him. We flirt with God, but give ourselves, give ourselves to everyone or everything else that catches our eye. We naturally only turn to God when we are in trouble and our resources are exhausted, and then we give Pharaoh's duplicitous speech. And the question is, how can God change us? And the answer is actually the day of the Lord. In that day. Because Jesus comes and John the Baptist says, I'm looking for judgment day. And Jesus says, yes, I am bringing judgment day. But I'm not bringing judgment day on all the people that you call sinners. I am bringing judgment day on myself. Because everyone in the town said, that fool Hosea is paying for Gomer's food when all the other men are with her. And Hosea says, I will take the hit for this woman. 
And when this woman, maybe in a moment, sees what love really is, maybe she will turn. The day of the Lord is the day of His presence. It's the storm of Jonah, and it's the coming of the bridegroom. We see it in Matthew, when Jesus is on the cross. All of this Old Testament imagery of the day of the Lord is poured into the crucifixion scene in Matthew. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over that land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cries out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? How could God forsake his son? How could a bride forsake her husband? The question is, will the husband forsake the bride? And what length will he go to teach her what love really is? And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from bottom from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life, and they came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those who were with him were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. Why didn't those pagans see that? Because people don't forgive the unforgivable. But God is not like us. And then the question remains, if we are forgiven the unforgivable, what will we do? Will we keep going and doing what we've done? We're probably going to have a hard time not doing it because we're so used to it. But God says, this is what I'm doing through Jesus and his sacrifice, and this is what I'm doing in your heart. In that day, I will make a covenant for them between the beasts of the field and the birds of the sky and the creatures that move along the ground, bow and sword and battle, I will abolish from the land so that all may lie down in safety. Isn't this what we want? I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice and love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness and you will acknowledge the Lord. You will finally get the relationship you've always longed for. In that day I will respond, declares the Lord. I will respond to the skies and they will respond to the earth. And the earth will respond to the grain, the new wine and the olive oil and they will respond to Jezreel, the first name. I will plant her for myself in the land. I will show my love, the second name. To the one I called not my loved one, and I will say to those who are called not my people, you are my people, and they will say, you are my God. The only question is, how will you respond? We are Gomer. Will we keep chasing other lovers, or will we turn to the one who really loves us? us? That's the question. Will you still value God only for what you can get out of Him? Will you reciprocate the love He has showed by taking justice and giving you grace? Will you show that grace to God by showing it to the Gomers in your life? Because here's the thing. When I'm talking about Gomer, your mind filled with all kinds of people who have done you wrong. They might be your spouse. They might be your kid. They might be your neighbor. They might be your ex. And the question is, how will you be to them? Will you be Hosea? Will you be God? Let's pray. Lord, we can't be you. We can only be like you. But Lord, most of the time we're more like Gomer. We're a bad risk. Forgive us, Lord, for the ways we betray. Help us, Lord, to understand 
what it cost you to have us. May we shrink from our ingratitude and may we instead live out gratitude. Hear our prayer. In the name of Jesus, amen. Would you stand?